Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. Welcome to Wednesday uh, of Procona Live. I'm going to introduce our panel, get them up here to start chatting with everybody about the cloud and where we're at. So why don't all of you come on up and we'll I'll go through the names you can wave out. Barron is a widely recognized expert on database internals, web performance, and large-scale application development. His best-selling technical books and open-source software are used by tens of thousands of engineers every day. Before founding Vivid Cortex, Barron was a good, an executive at Percona. He has a degree in computer science. Sean, Sean Briscoe is a graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School of Computer Science, where she studied under Fred Brooks. After a brief stint as a developer at a Chapel Hill startup, Sean began her career on the business side of technology at Red Hat, sticking with the open source giant from its startup days to when it achieved over a billion dollars in revenue. Prior to Percona, Sean worked in the consulting group specializing in open source business strategy focused on helping enterprises harness the power of open source software and cult culture. At Percona, Sean is responsible for consulting and managed service products. Thank you, Sean. Sunil Kamath is Principal Program Manager at Microsoft, where he works on Azure Data Services. He leads the product management function for OSS Database Services on Azure and recently helped launch MySQL and Postgres service. Prior to Microsoft, Sunil worked at IBM Toronto Labs for over 15 years and held several technical leadership and executive roles in the area of IBM Cloud Performance Engineering, Hardware and Software Co-Engineering, and product performance architect for IBM's flagship DB2 distributed database. He earned an MS in my, um, computer science at the University of Alberta. Good morning, Sunil. <laughs> and Lixen Pang is a staff database engineer for Alibaba Cloud, a senior developer for the MariaDB Foundation, and has been an Oracle ACE director for MySQL since 2013. Lixon is also Vice President of the All China MySQL User Group and has contributed numerous features and bug fixes to the MySQL MariaDB community, such as multi-source replication, memory thread monitoring, flashback, and others. Lixon is also co-translator of the Chinese version of the high-performance MySQL and MariaDB knowledge base. Welcome. Lixen. So first question for the group. With the push into the microservices space, do you see companies moving away from traditional databases and towards discrete data services? Uh, Lixon, you want to start us off? Yes. Uh, uh, in, my okay. uh, 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 in my opinion, uh, whatever in the cloud or in the uh, private environment, the data, the data service is a trade. And uh, uh, I can see uh, whatever uh, the traditional uh, database vendor like uh, Microsoft or Oracle, they also have the uh, database service product. So uh, we consider the uh, data service and the traditional database uh, doesn't conflict. So uh, of course it, it, it's a trade and uh, so uh, and uh, many companies is moving to the data service but uh, it not conflict with um, traditional database is uh, uh, my opinion. Yeah. Sunil, what do you think? So, well, yeah, so, uh, of course, I mean, if you look at the history of uh, how applications were built, uh, yes, uh, they, they were um, big, huge monolithic applications using one big monolithic database. And of course, the microservices is a big uh, positive shift that's happening, um, where now the developers are more empowered and uh, actually developers uh, call the shots. And, and that's a good thing um, because for businesses that needs to rapidly innovate, uh, they can do a lot more efficiently, get the applications out much more in an agile way. And they are uh, well, de designing and developing this, also looking at fit for purpose databases and tools that best uh, serves the needs of the microservice. So uh, I do definitely see that uh, uh, there are now more database choices. Uh, they, th these database choices are good uh, for developers. They are uh, specialized databases that meets the, uh, the purpose of the, the application that's being developed. 
And, um, and at Microsoft, we believe that we need to provide, therefore, a broad set of database choices to these developers, and not just SQL, but also MySQL, Postgres, MariaDB, and so on, so they have the full uh, choice of using the best tool for their uh, needs. What are your thoughts, Sean? Um, I think that this is a concept that's really familiar to the open source community. Um, if you look at how Linux was developed, for example, you know, we talk a lot about a community of development, thousands of developers, and what does that mean? Are they all working on Linux at the same time? No, it, it's a, it was developed modularly from the beginning, and that was really um, part of the driver behind the success of open source development. So I think um, people in the open source community are familiar with this concept. Um, it'll all be in how companies um, uh, do culturally. Will they be able to affect this change um, culturally? Will they be successful? Um, you know, we saw SOA was, of course, the precursor of this and the enterprise service bus, and, and that has gone by the wayside. So it'll be interesting to see what this happens, uh, what happens with this. Um, I definitely think it's good. Um, I'm a believer in the open source way and open source culture, and I think this sort of follows that cultural um, shift. You see um, the, the imprint that open source is making across um, software development um, in general. Do I think it's the end of the traditional database? No, I think um, you know MySQL, especially Postgres, the big open source databases that have been around for 10 years or so are just really coming into their maturity and it's exciting to see um, now large enterprises who used to be um, scared of open source and they used to choose um, the enterprise license companies just because they thought that was safe and that was the right thing to do for an enterprise application realize the value of open source and see how they can adopt open source um, uh, to, to develop web scale modern applications. And, and we see this happening with MySQL and Postgres and, and Mongo today. So I don't think they're going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> did you say in the introduction that you studied with uh, Fred Brooks? I did. That's awesome. <laughs> it was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So as you were speaking about SOA, um, it reminded me of my first job out of college where um, my first engineering manager um, <clears throat> you know, this was 2003, 2004, and um, it was an all Microsoft shop, um, and Microsoft's frameworks for service-oriented uh, applications and development were just, you know, they were making a big push, and my manager was really drinking the Kool-Aid. And I was trying to, like, dial it back a little bit with him in a discussion, with a team discussion, where he was saying, basically, we should throw everything out that we had written and, you know, build it all. And, and this guy was not, you know, a newcomer. He was, he was a really seasoned engineer. Um, and I said, there's no silver bullet. <laughs> and he goes, this is the silver bullet. <laughs> and um, of course, that was a precursor to microservices. Um, my experience with microservices is a little bit interesting. And I see a lot of, you know, I follow a lot of uh, technical people on Twitter and, and a bunch of other places I kind of tune into the conversation. Um, and I see a lot of people actually pushing it back against microservices, depending on the stage of development. Um, you know, the, 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 um, the folks who have gotten pretty badly burned by the complexity of microservices before it's warranted are pushing back and going, you know, start with a freaking monolith, right? And when you figure out that it's time to break up your monolith, then break it up, you know? Um, and that's exactly what we did at, at Vivid Cortex. We started with a monolith. Our entire services tier was one blob. And in fact, we had a mono repo for everything, including all of our agent code, you know, the, the web app, everything was in one repo. And, um, and we just very carefully watched, and I'm, I'm going to claim in hindsight that this was all skill, right? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't all skill. Part of, part of the roadmap, right? <laughs> totally the roadmap. Yeah, everything went as, as expected, right? Um, but what we, what we did was we just watched really carefully for the various kinds of pressures that came up. Uh, there was performance pressure. Fortunately, you know, we were dogfooding Vivid Cortex, and so we could start to see when there were performance problems and start to break things off. I mean, the first thing that we did was actually literally just deploy two versions of our mono service and, and put all of the writes through one of them with all the read paths dormant but still there, and all of the reads going through another one, you know, so that we separated our reads and writes. And then we broke things out into not exactly microservices, but macroservices, you know, collections of services. So um, that's been, you know, a short version of our uh, experience with microservices. So, Sean, you, you felt clearly that there's still a place for the traditional database going forward. 
Absolutely. I mean, we're seeing so much growth in the use of open source databases, um, all the way from startups who realize that still today that open source um, is a democratizer um, and it allows them to compete early on with their um, bigger, more entrenched um, competitors. But um, now enterprises see real value in adopting open source technologies and open source databases. Um, we're, we're just seeing a ton of that. Sunil, what do you thought uh, on the place for the traditional databases? I don't know anymore what do we mean by traditional databases. Um, because one of the good things that has happened with open source is whenever the developers have had a, a challenging problem to solve, they go and build a new stuff, right? And, and that's what we call like this was led to the fragmentation of the different options that are available out there in GitHub and all the repos out there in the open source. So I think there's a life, the, the, it, all these tools are going to live together. That's, that's, the, that's the environment we're going to be in. And, and that's be, purely because, as I said earlier, it's really the empowerment of the developer. So either they will use the tool that is best serving their application needs, or if, if it's not, they'll collaborate in the open community and build a new tool. But does that really meet their needs? Um, you know, does it empower the developer, or does it add a bunch of complexity to the decisions they have to make? Of course. Uh, I mean, it does add complexity, too. Uh, so there's, there's no free lunch, uh, of course, uh, because uh, as a um, developer, if it sits one purpose, I mean, the mentality of the open community is, all right, if, if it's solving my problem, then perhaps it might solve somebody else's problem, too. So that's how the community builds around a product. Um, and then, of course, as you, as you, uh, we talk about these microservices, and, and, and suppose you have a big, huge microservice. Uh, in fact, our service, our Azure service, is actually based off the microservice architecture. So, so we've had some experiences uh, developing that, some pain points, too, uh, doing that. Uh, it's, it's hard, as, as to um, Baron's point. Um, but then the, the complexity is really about now, how do I bring all these siloed applications together? Because if then um, where, where, where the business starts to get uh, interesting or has to make uh, decisions and bring all this data together, now how do I do my data integration? So who solves the complexity of data in integration? Um, so, but I think it will, it will all evolve. Uh, there is, there is, there is, a, there is a, a, a spot for all of these tools. And yes, there is complexity, and that's why we are engineers. Okay. Lexan, what do you think? Uh, 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 in my opinion, uh, uh, the, the cloud vendor uh, just uh, 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 sets up channel for the uh, database. So whatever the open source database or the commercial database or traditional database, uh, uh, the, the choice is, is made by the customers. As long as the database is easy to use, is, has good performance, and is stable enough, then of course all the database will have a place to, uh, in, in the future. So I think uh, uh, open, whatever the open source database and the transitional database, of course they will have a place. Just uh, you, need, you need to make sure your database is, is, uh, is good, easy, uh, easy to use. So um, over the week, we've talked about the shift to the polyglot um, deployments. So I'd like to hear, how are your companies helping customers monitor and manage multiple databases? Baron? Oh, I'd love to talk about that. Yeah, everybody, <laughs> please, please use more different types of databases. Use, you know, um, <coughs> use Fibonacci numbers of databases. <laughs> Go from 5 to 8 to 13. Um, because uh, when you have a whole bunch of different databases um, and you need to monitor them all together, they're really, they're really one database, even though they may be on many different um, technologies and many different um, uh, nodes, um, even many different clusters. You really have one database, um, and they're all working together, um, and they're tightly coupled to your application. And so when you need to understand how all those things are behaving together, I mean, Vivid Cortex is the only game in town, so <laughs> bring it on, you know. <laughs> Um, but seriously, you know, I, I think um, to Sunil's point about the, the best tool for the job, I think that's actually how we end up in these things. Um, and it's a very natural evolution. Right? You start out with, let's just say you start out with MySQL, and then your application gets a little more sophisticated, and you need some search, and then you realize that MySQL um, isn't always the best fit for all of the different search patterns, and so then you, you split that off, and you put it into a dedicated search technology, and then you've got some key value tables that are just hot as hell, and you put those into Redis, and, um, and then... 
you know, just one thing leads to another, and so you end up with these, with these complex multimodal databases of um, lots of different technologies working together. And I think managing them together while still keeping them decoupled so that you can involve them and you don't just pour concrete around them, that's the real trick in my view. Um, measuring them together is certainly uh, a hard problem. You know, um, having a, a sensible way to approach them. I, my, my worldview is that databases exist to do work. And you should measure the work that they're doing. That's the queries. So you, know, you, you can measure all of the status counters and other things that you can chart and graph. That's, it's OK. Um, but if you're not measuring and monitoring the queries, you're really not measuring and monitoring the reason that those databases are even running. Um, so, you know, Vivid Cortex, again, to put a product pitch in here, I mean, that's front and center in what we do is we just measure that uh, application database interaction, um, which is hard, but it's definitely very valuable to do. Sean? Um, we do see um, most of our customers past a certain size are using multiple different databases for the job. Um, obviously, the most popular ones that we see companies using are Postgres, MySQL, and Mongo today. Um, but we have customers asking us, well, now we want to use um, Couchbase, and we want to use, the, they come up with all these different ideas of things that they want um, their DBA team to specialize in. And I see the, the, um, the team sort of look like a deer in headlights because they think, well, how am I going to learn all this stuff and become an expert in all this stuff? So. Um, yep, yeah, Percona supports the polyglots. Um, we support them by specializing in these areas, MySQL, um, now Postgres, um, Mongo, Maria. Um, and then if their team has to go and learn more things, then we can sort of take that burden off the team from the um, more traditional and, and leading um, open source enterprise grade databases and they can, they can go and learn new technology. Um, we definitely support that. But I think the, the, diff the difficult thing is operational consistency. Um, and what is the cost of supporting all of these technologies? Um, on the one hand, we have, um, we're in an era right now where um, there's so much creativity in the, in the database world. And that's, that's fantastic. And it makes all of us sharper. You know, we're seeing all the new things come out with MySQL 8 and um, uh, that's fantastic that we're, we're all kind of challenging each other and we're seeing um, uh, new uh, technology growth. But um, from an internal um, corporate perspective, how do you balance um, the cost of um, supporting all these different technologies? And I think those decisions are really strategic. We tend to want to choose technologies because they're cool. Um, but if you've been around for a while, you've seen um, companies suffer from um, technology decisions that were made early on that can affect you in, in big ways as you grow and now we're dealing with web scale growth. It can happen really fast. So we shouldn't fall into the, um, the trap of choosing a technology because it's cool. We want to think strategically about how we grow and operationally and also culturally how will we be able to support all of this um, and is this a, a wise decision for our company today. Sneil, how are you guys helping the customers manage the multiple? Well, I mean, first by providing managed services. Um, because when, when we talk to enterprises, when we talk to the CIOs, one of the, the, one of the, four, the two of the foremost concerns they always come out with is, how will you red help reduce my costs? And how will you make sure that any, any data that I store is secure? Um, and, and, and these just like, like you talk one CIO after the other, I mean, the concerns are all common. And, and, and the Microsoft approach to actually uh, tackling this is, of course, providing consistent experience uh, of managing and operating on your data, regardless of whether you are using a MySQL or using Postgres, you're using MariaDB, you're using uh, Cosmos or any other NoSQL store, et cetera, or even uh, our own Azure SQL database. So, provide, so creating that consistent uh, frame in how you uh, operate and how you manage your data um, significantly helps customers to, um, to reduce their operational cost because it's the same look and feel. And, and then they're interacting with uh, the, the data stores regardless of what they are, what names they have, uh, by using consistent RESTful APIs. Um, so, so that's one way we are looking at uh, adding. And then, of course, um, making sure that security is front and center uh, and there is uh, um, auditability of all the data that is going in because 
Um, we, we know that, I mean, as, as much as developers are scaling their applications by using a multi, multitude of different types of databases, one of the big concerns for the CIO is, how do I ensure that our consistent security policies and auditing that is available in each of these stores, right? So, and now increasingly they want the cloud provider of the managed service to actually handle those security aspects, and then the role of the DBA or the role of the enterprise itself is governing and making sure they have the right, like who can see the data, who cannot see the data, and so on. How are you folks doing it, Lexington? Yeah, uh, for us, uh, in fact, uh, we have a uh, um, management and uh, control system. It can support uh, most of the open source database. For example, MySQL, MongoDB, and uh, PostgreSQL, and Redis, and and so on. Uh, and and also we can have have the uh, customers monitor uh, different database and provide the uh, provide the same portal for different different database. And I think the, the most important thing is that should uh, uh, the customer should consider uh, why you need so many different databases. <laughs> yeah, uh, because. Uh, uh, if you use the different database in different applications, I think uh, it may be uh, uh, re re uh, reasonable because the workload may be different. But uh, if you use different database in the, in the same application, I think uh, the customer should consider uh, the cost. You should maintain that so many different databases is, is really valuable. Uh, of course, for us, we can provide the ability to the customers, but the customers should uh, um, think about the cost. And when you talk about customers, are you mm -hmm. talking about internal customers or external or both? Both. Both. Yeah. Cool. So how will technologies like um, autonomous databases change cloud deployments? And I think important to the folks here in the room, how will this, how does this evolve or change the developer and DBA role with that? Who wants to jump at it? I'm looking forward to <laughs> autonomous databases, autonomous driving cars, and autonomous flushing toilets. <laughs> and when we get the autonomous flushing toilets working correctly, then I think you know, we'll, we'll have a good start on some of the others. But <laughs> <laughs> right now, <clears throat> um, when I think about things like um, you know, self-tuning databases, um, I think about a lot of experience that I have with writing database tuning scripts and things like that. Um, and there's a... There's a Big downside to getting these things wrong, and often you're, there's not as much of an upside to getting them right. Um, so I think we have to be really careful about the cost-benefit trade-offs of those things. What I see as the clear winner, um, I don't know about self-driving databases and self-tuning databases and things like that, although there's you know, certainly examples of those things working well. But what I see as the clear winner that really um, is, uh, I think, a, a pretty much a win for anybody who has experienced any level of scale is to start building data services internally, which goes to my last question to Lixon. Um, you know, I imagine that as you built your platform, first you were serving internal customers and then you started serving external, yeah. right? That's the typical pattern. Um, so we have, you know, folks who are sort of being full stack um, and then we recognize that we've reached a level of scale to where it makes sense to build a data platform and provide that to internal customers. And, and a lot of the microservices model um, typically tends to go along with this. Uh, how it'll impact the DBA and the developers, um, you know, the, the developers, it, it feels like a lot of times things get abstracted away from us as developers and we don't have to worry about them anymore. And then when we cause serious problems, we realize that we actually need to know what's going on under the hood. Um, so I worry if we develop a generation of, of engineers who think that the database is magic. Um, right now, I think, you know, we're, we're still in a world where people can start out their career thinking that the database is magic and you can throw anything at it. Um, and then uh, they get educated out of that fairly quickly, I think, you know, by the time they start to, um, you know, rise through the, the levels of their capability as engineers. Um, so it starts out feeling like magic, but it doesn't stay that way for very long. I don't think that I ever want to see a world where that's the case. You know, I don't think I ever want to see a world where people don't understand what their systems are really doing at the lo lower levels. Because otherwise, uh, you cause problems at high levels of abstraction. They manifest at the low levels. And then you have to trace them back to the high level where, where you cause them. And you know, this is just a ubiquitous pattern. The harder we make that, the worse it gets. Yeah. Lixon, what do you think? Uh, in my opinion, uh, the uh, self tuning database uh, currently is impossible to uh, replace people's thinking completely, because uh, uh, even in the internet application, we have lots of uh, experience about how to uh, 
to turn in the database. But of course, uh, we can't cover all the user cases. So currently, uh, in fact, we have a system called Cloud DBA. It can uh, get it can get the state from the database kernel and the host, and the, uh, host kernel. And uh, based on this information, we can give some suggestion for the database, how, uh, how, how the database can uh, run uh, uh, for better performance. Uh, or, or currently, it has some uh, issues. You need to fix it. Uh, but the problem is that uh, uh, we don't believe we can cover all the, uh, all the cases. So we just give the suggestion for the users. So you just can choose uh, if you uh, uh, accept the, uh, the suggestion or you don't accept. And uh, of course, if we, if we uh, if the customers agree with us to uh, optimize their database uh, automatically, of course we can do it. But currently, we don't consider uh, any any uh, self tuning system can cover all the user cases. Well, I'll keep my answer short. Um, I think autonomous databases is a glorified marketing term. Um, <laughs> and um, I, I kind of look at it as the opportunity of how you can bring data and machine learning to actually improve the productivity of the DBA. So I think, um, I, I, and in specific areas where enterprises are struggling with, for example, security. Um, like suppose say your database is being DDoS attacked how can I use machine learning and how can I uh, use my existing pattern of data and profile that pattern and then uncover that uh, before the attack really happens? Um, and if I have a complex workload, how can I learn my workload patterns over a period of time and then using machine learning algorithms and come up with better suggestions and tuning recommendations? Um, I think it's... Um, um, I don't think necessarily that uh, a database that can scale like automatically is autonomous, essentially. Um, it's, it's, it will be visible in some specific uh, use cases that are very, very core uh, to enterprises like security and, and, and also improving the productivity of the DBA. So I think this is actually going to be a big, huge friend of a DBA as opposed to competing with a DBA. Okay. Last word from you, Sean. I speak for women the world over, Baron, that we're looking for automatically dropping toilet seats. I think people can ask me later because we're probably out of time, but I do, I, I mirror Sunil's thoughts. Great. Well, I appreciate everybody's time that you and what you contributed. Thanks everybody for listening and being with us and move on to the next thing.